So, uh, as you guys all know, my name is Ross Shulman. Uh, one of the things that I've been working on uh, under the auspices of the Cybersecurity Initiative for the past uh, little while here has been a uh, work on studying vulnerabilities, software vulnerabilities, how they're found, how they're distributed, how they're sold on the black market oftentimes, how they're reported to companies, and how they're patched, and how those patches are disseminated. And because everybody here on stage knows more about that process than I do, I just thought I'd bring them all together and do some research for my paper that you all can listen to. It's really great. It's convenient. Good trick. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so uh, I want to do real quick introductions, and then I want to dive into it. So um, from, I don't know, stage right to stage left. Yeah, going down the line. So uh, Christopher Robinson, otherwise known as C-Rob, is Senior Program Manager for Red Hat Product Security. Uh, he's got 18 years of enterprise class engineering, uh, and he's worked at several Fortune 500 companies, in, uh, including financial, medical, legal, and manufacturing verticals. Um, and we are happy to have him here today to Thank you. present a sort of open source look at things. Uh, Art Mannion is a senior member of the Vulnerability Analysis Team at uh, CERT Coordination Center at CMU, right? Uh, he studied vulnerabilities and coordinated responsible disclosure efforts since 2001 uh, and gained mild notoriety for saying don't use Internet Explorer in a conference. <laughs> <laughs> At the time it was true, no longer true. Uh, Stefan Smogi uh, is a product manager with the security and privacy team at Google. Uh, he uh, includes uh, safe browsing, Google's end-to-end -end system that protects over a billion users worldwide from malware and phishing and relevant to the uh, presentation we just had from Amy, uh, he also manages the end-to-end -end, um, strong encryption uh, Chrome plugin, so thank you for that. Good job. Mm -hmm. uh, and then finally, and certainly not least, uh, Katie Masuris is Chief Policy Officer at HackerOne, which is a, prov a platform provider for coordinated vulnerability response and structured bounty programs. Um, a noted authority on vulnerability disclosure, and she advises lawmakers, customers, and researchers such as myself, oftentimes, uh, to help legitimize and promote security research and help make the internet safer for everyone. So thank you for that. Um, so without further ado, this is gonna be a slightly less formal panel. It's gonna be more of a discussion amongst everybody. Uh, we're gonna do two, actually, we're gonna discuss two case studies um, of recent high profile bugs that or vulnerabilities in software, uh, or actually in, in some cases sort of in hardware as well, how those vulnerabilities were discovered, how they were communicated to the authorities uh, responsible for the, for the software in question, and how they were patched and, and fixed at the end of the day. So the first one that we're gonna discuss, uh, a lot of people probably heard about. It made quite a splash at DEF CON uh, this past year. Um, on October 10th of 2015, Charlie Miller and Chris Valasek published a paper entitled Remote Exploitation of an Unaltered Passenger Vehicle. And if you sort of have any uh, inkling of what that means, it is a scary, scary title. Um, basically what Chris and Charlie discovered is that they could take a completely stock, fresh off the factory floor, Jeep Jan Grand Cherokee, and through the use of a laptop and a cell phone and a couple other pieces of, of gadgetry, take over that Jeep remotely, not in the car, but from anywhere, and drive it. It is a terrifying prospect. Um, and, they, and they laid this all out uh, on the DEF CON stage uh, last August. Uh, notably, uh, the, the cover, and I, I urge everyone to, to look at this, but the cover of the, um, of the paper uh, has both Chris and uh, Charlie with um, two tank, wearing tank tops that say, sun's out, gun's out on them. Um, <laughs> but the content after the title page is really quite serious. Um, and so I want to dive right in um, and, and so, you know, obviously there's a terrifying image that sort of comes up when we first get uh, this in our heads, but um, just as a blanket level question, for I think everyone that would kind of kick off our conversation, how is the Internet of Things sort of revolution? We're connecting everything to the network now that was not connected before. How is that impacting what you guys see as vulnerability research, disclosure, um, and patching? Um, and I'll let anybody jump in on that. Well, there, you know, from the perspective of trying to find the right contact at some of these organizations that suddenly uh, find themselves as software vendors, essentially. These were vendors who were, who were designing you know, their products, and there may have been some software 
to make the product work, but the internet connectivity that they're adding sort of as a, you know, it's a product feature for them, they're not appropriately securing and they also are not in, in large form um, introducing a way to actually handle security vulnerabilities that are reported to them. There's often no way to contact these folks. I think Rapid7 did a great study on uh, interconnected, um, you know, it was baby monitors. And of all the different companies that have, you know, these apps where you can watch your baby remotely, uh, there was only one, and that was Philips, that even had a published way to contact them about security vulnerabilities and some sort of a process to deal with it. So we're seeing Internet of Things. It's a proliferation of things on the Internet. Absolutely no plan to handle security issues when they come up. Right. So to Katie's point, right, new, new players in the coordinated vulnerability disclosure game, absolutely. Uh, another angle we're looking at is there's... Uh, sort of the cyber physical safety sector issues. You know, baby monitors are one thing, you have a privacy issue there. It doesn't feel good to have someone, you know, watching your kid, right? Um, but to, the, to the, the Jeep example, we've got, you know, internet connected physical devices that could hurt, injure, or kill someone. Uh, that's much different than uh, I lost my credit card to a phishing attack or a, a vulnerability in a PDF reader or something like that, so. So digging in a little bit on on sort of Charlie and Chris's, uh, I dare say, epic hack. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I think the first thing I want to dig into is what do they do right? Um, you know, I know that at the time of the DEF CON talk, they were already, had been for months working with Chrysler to make sure that they knew about it. Um, and so I'd like to talk a little bit about what does that mean in terms of like, is that a good way to, that obviously that's a good way to do disclosure. What do they do right in this process? I mean, ultimately, yep, uh, ultimately, the point of doing responsible vulnerability disclosure is making sure the right people know about the right details mm -hmm. and in order to enable the largest number of people to be protected. And so just starting from the ability to, to communicate and then going from there and not being penalized for it. I mean, you know, it's not that long ago in the dark days where companies' first response to any form of vulnerability announcement was to rattle attorneys at the reporters. Uh, fortunately, by and large, the enlightened parts of the industry uh, have moved beyond that. Uh, it's, it's not exclusively so, but fortunately, most people are doing that. And I think that's, that's the best starting point right there, is just to talk. Uh, so yes, and, and Unfortunately, parts, unenlightened parts of the industry still rattle attorneys these mm. days. So uh, the, some of these new players to the disclosure game are, are, some of the lessons they're learning are still how to respond and, and if lawyer rattling is appropriate or not. Um, something to your question, uh, they got attention. Yeah. And that's a two-sided discussion. I, have a, I, I feel both ways about that. But getting attention, um, help raise the priority of something that was very serious, I think. So that's, there's something to be said for that. It's real dichotomy we're in right now where you have the flashy presentation of hacking a Jeep or having a name and a logo on a vulnerability, which is very exciting to the public and catches their interest and helps sometimes raise the uh, priority of the issue. But other, the, the negative side of that is sometimes things are, Mountains are made out of molehills. Something isn't as important as it really is, and there are other more important issues that should be dealt with. You know, and I think you know, hackers are motivated just the same as any other human being on Earth. It's a combination of factors: compensation, recognition, and pursuit of intellectual happiness. You know, and these folks definitely got a huge amount of recognition for you know, positive and negative for for their method of disclosure. But I just kind of want to ask the question. Everyone, you know, who is familiar with that car hacking, knows, you know, it's it's Charlie and and Chris. Has anyone heard of a person named Mark Rogers? Also did a car hacking talk last year. Also worked with the vendor. In that case, it was Tesla. But none of you have heard of him. And he did all of those things except drive a car on the freeway uh, with somebody else you know, behind the wheel uh, not able to control it. So what is interesting about that attention getting is yes, it raises the level of awareness for the general public to be able to do, you know, uh, in that case, you know, there was a recall and so it raised the level of awareness that the customer had to take action to protect themselves. But because Tesla has an over-the-air update model, 
there was no real reason to, to cause such a fuss in order to get that uptake of that update. And here's a, you know, another researcher who is essentially work, doing all the right things, and you've never heard of him. Well, now you have. Hello, Mark. <laughs> Well, and so that, that sort of leads into what my, I think my, what my next question is, is, and that is, you know, I think a lot of people look at what Chris and Charlie did and said, oh, that's, you know, that's I, anywhere on a sort of a range between completely and utterly irresponsible to, well, you know, it's sort of stunt hacking, right? And it's like, it's for the, for the glory of, of the hack, basically. And, and so, uh, you know, question for you guys is, you know, first of all, is, is stunt hacking, is that, a, is that a useful nomenclature? Is that, a, is that a thing that we need to be, like, talk about or worry about? Um, and if it is, is it a useful thing or a dangerous thing? So, uh, without necessarily using the words, well, it, an another angle on this is raising, raising broad public attention is one thing. There are cases where sort of the software developer or vendor uh, is not responding, and sometimes, unfortunately, it takes uh, public disclosure without, you know, without prior coordination or without a fix being in place or some stunt awareness raising activity to uh, sort of motivate a response from the, from the software developer or vendor. That's another reason you would do something like that, potentially. Um, it, 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 it's a really mixed bag. I mean, I'm, I'm going to hold my uh, other half of my point of view on this one, but um, it, it, there are reasons to do it. Raising awareness and, and driving sort of a, a vendor response, I think, are two reasonably valid, valid points. Mm -hmm. But if all you accomplish is raise the bar of knowledge on the part of your typical consumer, there's a certain benefit there. I mean, trying to find the right balance between freaking people the hell out, <laughs> which is short term, very beneficial, gets you lots of column inches. But long term, I think there was a study yesterday or somebody published some data that said, you know, of the people polled, only 25% even remembered the GPAC from last year. I think uh, Andy Greenberg did a follow up to, to his piece. Mm -hmm. And there's two sides to that. There's the, wow, 25% actually remembered. <laughs> and then there's the, well, 75%, it just it became part of the background. Right. So there is, you know, I hesitate to say consumer apathy. But well, and, and is the is the sort of you know since Heartbleed we've sort of like oh well we need to brand every bug is oh, sure. do, is that like sort of contributing to the sort of oh it's just another whatever I mean I, in some sense like people are at least aware that there is a thing called a software vulnerability now which is probably a net good but at the same time you know it's like every week there's like a, a new one with a flashy HTML5 website that doesn't load on old browsers it, it's unfortunate that over the last few years we've had so many high profile incidents whether it's a, a breach like a target or a home depot or it's been a branded vulnerability i, I absolutely do believe consumers are numb to it mm -hmm. and uh, I, you sometimes will see researchers competing to have the, the flashiest thing we had an incident called drowned last week mm -hmm. where there was a it's actually several problems going on and it was uh, several competing research teams, and at the end of the day, one of the teams uh, disclosed early to trump the other folks. They mm. tried to capture some of the mm. headlines. Mm. Interesting. That was a little against yeah. what we all agreed upon. Well, and uh, you know, I think there's, um, in terms of raising awareness, the the full disclosure versus you know versus coordinated disclosure debate is is one of those things where people will reasonable people will disagree on the best way to minimize risk so when there's a you know when there's a vendor that's unresponsive or you know doesn't respond for a very long time on an important issue often releasing public details is the only way to kind of get you know, get the vendor to move or get the, the end user to deal with it. And I think of the stunt hacking as an evolution in amping up that volume. So even though they coordinated with the, with the company in question, which was Chrysler, um, they, they amped up the volume on the disclosure to raise the awareness and have people take action. Now, I think a more interesting problem is why does it take a stunt hack in order to get people to apply a patch, and an even deeper question, why is the consumer responsible for applying that patch to that, that device, in that case, the vehicle? Right. So I would love to see more vendors take more, you know, not only take security seriously, but actually take the distribution of patches seriously. Because that is the thing that, you know, as our infrastructure becomes more and more dependent on interconnected That's devices, Consumers, are you really going to patch your fridge 
Are you, will you patch your toaster today? See, Rob will. You know? I, I, patch, I patch my TVs this week. <laughs> well, and you know, if it's burning your toast, yes, you probably will. But otherwise, you know, if it's going to be, if it's going to be used in a distributed denial of service attack uh, to go after, you know, to go after a, a nation state, will you actually think to patch that toaster? Probably not. So, I mean, I think we need, we need to look at the advent of uh, securing the Internet of Things and securing all of these Internet de uh, devices as a chance to not just build security in from the ground up and, and write more secure code, but a chance to actually fix the problems with distributing patches. We don't have a zero-day problem. We have a patch distribution problem, yep. folks. Yeah. And that's going to be endemic across the whole of things space. Many of these companies aren't a traditional software uh, distributor. They don't understand all the processes that need to be put into place, and they're kind of pushing a product out to market. It's very exciting, but they don't have the methodology around uh, having a web page that has a, a contact information. You find a problem, tell us. They don't have any infrastructure for pushing out patches. They have no mechanism to really talk to their consumers because the, the scale of their consumers aren't just a handful of enterprises, right. it's potentially it's hundreds everyone. of thousands. Yeah. Right. Everyone with a fridge. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, and it's turtles all the way down as well, because <laughs> there are plenty of you know, nominally automatic patch mechanisms that themselves are insecure. So right. you wind up having to disclose <laughs> yeah. a vulnerability against the patch management right. system. Right. So, so and use the patch management system to patch itself. If you can. Assuming it's not compromised, right. yes. Right. Yeah, secure over the air updates are basically, without, without that, there's no hope of consumer and user stuff ever getting fixed. That has to be in place, and we're, we're well behind. Yeah. Well, that was really uplifting. Uh, so let's turn, <laughs> let's turn to our other case study that I want to talk about today. Um, so on February 19th of 2015, uh, Mark Rogers posted a blog post um, about uh, some adware that he had found on Lenovo laptops um, that had been come pre-installed with uh, a, a program called Superfish, which is uh, an Israeli company that uh, basically um, replaces ads in the websites that you're visiting with their own ads. Uh, and, and so Lenovo had put this uh, pre-installed on the software. Now, the, the problem here is actually not so much the adware, although that's, I think, a separate issue that can be <laughs> discussed at length. Um, sure. But actually, that the, in order to do the job that it needed to do on secure websites, Superfish came with a uh, another sort of piece of software um, called Commodia, Commodia uh, which basically installs on the laptop a local root cert. Um, and unfortunately, in this case, the local root cert used the same private key for every single laptop uh, that Lenovo sold them. Meaning that once that private key was um, broken, and it was broken rapidly, um, anybody could man in the middle attack any Lenovo laptop that had the software installed on it. So um, this is a, a really interesting vulnerability in large part, and this is the first question I want to throw at you guys, because this is a case of sort of one man's vulnerability is another man's compliance regime. Um, and so I'd love it if you guys could take that and riff on it for a minute. <laughs> Just go. Let's see what you come up with. So the, the business model, right, was replace ads and make ad revenue right, right. off of that, or make, uh, make hits per ad, that sort of thing. In this case, yeah. Yeah, so, um, <coughs> yeah, so it's a feature. I, I've had a number of phone calls throughout the years where the, the vendor I'm talking to says, that's a feature of our software. <sighs> and we say, well, we call that a vulnerability. And right. we, we usually, you have to talk without those, those words and talk about the behavior, and then you agree on the behavior, call it what you want anyway. So feature vulnerability is an interesting discussion. Um, I do want to just point out, so the Lenovo came with Superfish. There's an interesting supply chain mess here, yeah. right? So Commodia makes this piece that's in Superfish that's on Lenovo laptops pre-installed. The Commodia redirector or whatever is in a lot of other stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's not at all, that problem is not at all limited to just Lenovo laptops. Yeah. Uh, a lot of sort of net nanny, help save my family, monitor my family's internet traffic sort of stuff yeah. uh, had that same exact problem. So. Weird supply chain, um, bundled software that comes with your device, comes with your laptop, comes with your download. You know, more software is worse in general. Uh, you do not want more software, you want less. Well, and, and you look how to uninstall it. It was very complex to rip that thing out. There were several steps you had to do to eliminate that from your system. So from a consumer perspective, it would be very difficult. It's not a easy button, click it and it's gone. It was challenging. Right. Um, 
what's the, so I, just to take a step back for some folks who may not know what a man in the middle attack is, it, um, it's basically allows, if you're trying to set up a secure communication with a, a, a far point on somewhere on the web, you, uh, you do a little handshake that, that says, hey, are you who you say you are? And the other server says, yes, I am. And there's ways to sort of validate that. The man in the middle attack basically sits uh, if you can get on the on the wire somewhere between those two points, you can uh, basically play each other off each other uh, if you know enough about the private key that they're trying to agree on, essentially. So you can listen in to what was supposed to be a secure com conversation, uh, and that's and that's basically uh, what this software did. It did. It was just on the wire in the computer rather than on the wire somewhere in the network, um, which makes it even easier. Um, but what was pernicious about that is the fact that it was user invisible. The user went to HTTPS theirbank.com and they had the little lock and they had all the things in the browser that tell the user you are secure. And the software, unbeknownst to the user, undeliberately installed by the user, was completely undermining that security. That's what the problem was there. So let's talk a little bit about how this was sort of, well, we know how it was discovered. It was um, Mark Rogers sort of posted a blog post out it and then it, it literally exploded from there. Um, but let's talk about a little, if you guys know sort of how this was mitigated. I know um, pretty shortly after Mark Rogers' blog post, um, Microsoft Defender, which is the, sort of the anti-malware um, built into Windows, I think it's seven and up or uh, something like that, um, basically uh, started recognizing it and, and marking it as malware and taking it out. Um, and and I've, I have, when I was doing my research on this, found a couple of CVEs that seemed related or, 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 or somewhat related. Is, are there, were there other ways in which um, this sort of, this progressed, and I think particularly, I, I know that public pressure on Lenovo was a big part of that, so if we can talk about that as well. Yeah, I, as I recall, uh, Lenovo provided directions and I think later software, some kind of little utility to, so users could easily point and click and remove this. As, as someone mentioned, it was not designed to be easily removed, so it was hard for a, a consumer to follow, you know, eight or nine steps or something like that. Um, the, uh, so I think it was Commodia fixed the software by providing uh, unique root CA certificates for every install, which is still a man in the middle and it's still bundled and unbeknownst to the user, but if you pop one certificate, you could only attack that one person. Except there was a second vulnerability where the, uh, the Commodia software didn't you know, if, if you browse to a website and you get a certificate error, your browser is supposed to tell you, hey, this isn't the site you think you're going to, right? Um, you mentioned their man in the middle. Their, their, their client in the middle didn't honor those kinds of errors and would just pass on a, a good connection to the user. So great. There's, there's, a, there's a second layer of problem in which you, even after the fix, you could still uh, attack people pretty easily. Right. So, and this, this is exactly the type of, of um, you know, pernicious software that really can only be discovered through security research. Um, OEM manufacturers do try to do some security checks and they run automated tools and, and whatnot, uh, you know, in order to try and find security bugs, but you can only go so far with automated tooling. Um, and this is exactly the kind of thing that, you know, for, for example, when we are trying to protect security research and enable their ability to reverse engineer software like this to find what it's actually doing and to observe and to warn, un, you know, un, otherwise uh, unaware consumers of the dangers of what's actually installed by the manufacturer, um, you know, that is one of the underlying issues that, that we need to make sure we preserve. The ability for security research to uncover these pernicious types of software that are violating security and privacy unbeknownst to the user and without the user's permission or control. So I think, oops. Yeah, it's fine. Just, just that's throw where it. it belongs. Um, so it seems to me, so in, in doing the research on this, I actually went back and I found a, a blog post from Commodia basically bragging about the abilities of their SSL sort of intercept software uh, as far back as 2009. And so it's not as if the, this ability was a secret. Right. And so I'm curious what about this caused it to blow up in Lenovo's face? I think, um, it, was it the, the one key ac across all the machines? Was it that it was ads and we have sort of a shaky relationship with ads these days? Is, is there something else about this that made it especially horrible and, and make it blow up? I think it's that idea that you know, users are much more aware 
of you know of of surveillance in general, and uh, this smacked of you know the smacked of of surveillance to them. You know, so I think um, consumer awareness of privacy and surveillance issues, you know, certainly can be credited to uh, the the revelations of the summer of 2014 and Edward Snowden. Um, but I think at this point, you know, consumers wanting to, to protect their privacy and protect their security um, is a significant market driver, which I think is why you see mega corporations stand, you know, at a at a standoff with uh, with law enforcement. Uh, you know, Apple versus FBI is the latest example of that. But without commercial viability, without users trusting your products. You've really got you know no ability to uh, you've got no ability to surveil anyway. So it's a it's a mixed bag. But I think it's the user awareness and this smacked of surveillance against their will. Mm -hmm. And I would even to, to swing this back to more of an of things debate. Uh, my personal opinion on the behavior of Superfish that that was bad. It was an awful <laughs> security practice to have a key across a whole fleet of devices, but it, it, it was deceptive in my opinion. Thinking about that behavior on a larger scale, um, more like an open source perspective, where you'll have um, a vendor compiling a, a deliverable for somebody, a, an internet connected refrigerator, I have some enterprise software, where you're picking and choosing software from all these different sources and not necessarily understanding um, how that software was made. That company may not have good software practices. The Superfish folks seem a little fishy. Uh, <laughs> selecting that vendor to bundle in, as part of your product, ultimately you're kind of you're taking on yeah. the, the ownership right. of that software. This is, we endorse this. Right. So uh, a lot of vendors you'll see in, in this of things space where you have this drive to quickly get to market where people aren't necessarily going through vendor management, they're not going through the appropriate due diligence mm -hmm. to make sure each piece of software or each piece of hardware I'm putting into this consumer good has been vetted and we understand you know, how to get it fixed if it breaks. Right. True. So I, th I think what, one last uh, question that I want to have before we throw it open to the audience, uh, sort of as my prerogative here, um, is to say a little, a little sort of more open, open blue sky-ish, and that is to say, Given what we sort of might almost term the dual use of what Commodia is selling here, how does that affect the vulnerability sort of process that you all that you all sort of live on a day-to-day -day basis? Is it is it harder to manage a vulnerability along these lines because you have to look at, look at it and say, you know, this isn't just like a bug that is clearly a bit wrong and someone's just screwed up and we need to patch it or fix it, but it's a little bit more complex than that. I'd, or isn't it? Well, if, if, I, if it's black and white to you, that's a, that's a the, valid answer the, too. The end state is not quite the same. You know, in a traditional, if there's such a thing anymore, disclosure process, there'd be you know, it'd be a valid bug, and there'd be fixed software, and it would be well deployed to people in a very timely fashion, right? Uh, in this case, there wasn't that sort of finality of a fix, and everyone's now safe. I'm sure there's a bunch of these old versions of Commodia still out there, and even the new versions still do the interception. So. That's an odd twist on this. And, and just to add, um, you know, we're talking about ad replacement, which no one's really a big fan of. There's a lot of sort of enterprise data loss prevention gear that does exactly this. Um, it does man in the middle SSL because otherwise you can't watch what's leaving your network. So there are, there are legitimate sort of business enterprise reasons to do this. Ostensibly, you know, you work at that enterprise, you've signed something that says, you know, my network traffic can be monitored. So there are real reasons to do this. Um, you know, the, so th this one's not, there's no final answer because you either have SSL end to end or you don't. And there's no middle ground fundamentally there, right? And TLS, sorry. Hopefully it's TLS, yeah. <laughs> yes, sorry. Yeah. I said the old word, <laughs> not sorry. SSL. Sorry. SSL's bad. I'm old enough to, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I think, I think the broader issue of, of supply chain mm -hmm. vulnerability coordination is, uh, is actually, you know, quite complex. Not necessarily, you know, this case is the best illustrator of that. But, I mean, if you think about if you think about the security of your mobile device, that does not, the, sec the end security of your mobile device does not depend on one vendor at all. If there is something in one of the firmware of the chips that's used by multiple manufacturers, you've got all of these coordination, um, 
you know, headaches and these hurdles to overcome, if it's in the operating system, you still have to coordinate up and down the supply chain stack. And then finally, if you are to get a patch pushed out to the users, you need to coordinate with the carriers whose business model is often to charge for data. So how do you actually manage that in that type of supply chain? How do you manage the vulnerability coordination? How do you manage testing of the patches? And how do you manage the distribution of those patches? And we have had smartphones, you know, essentially guiding us onto the internet uh, for, you know, at, at least, uh, you know, what, 2007 was when the, the iPhone came out, and that was really the big burst of smartphones. We're at 2016, and we haven't fully solved that problem for that complex supply chain in that ecosystem of mobile devices, let alone all of the other devices you know, in the world. So I think, yes, vulnerability coordination across supply chain, very, very difficult, an unsolved problem. This is an open problem in vuln coordination. Yeah. And if it's, a, if it's a problem that are, you guys think is, is interesting, I, I definitely recommend uh, getting engaged with a process that at least three of us on the stage are working with. Uh, there's an NTIA multi-stakeholder process going on right now. Um, that is tackling uh, these and other really uh, thorny questions in vulnerability management. So um, talk to Alan Friedman, who's here today somewhere, uh, about that. Um, there, there he is in the back waving. Everybody point. Um, and now he owes me that beer that he promised. Uh, um, just kidding, because that would be wrong in, in some ethical way that I'm fairly certain of. Um, Anyway, I want to throw the floor open to, uh, to you guys uh, who have questions. Um, and also, I know we've got someone monitoring the Twitter feed. So if there's questions coming in from Twitter, um, there's, uh, there's some there. And if you wouldn't mind waiting for the mic to come to you so that the folks on the live stream can hear it, too. So I think we had one over here. Yep, uh, the young lady over there. And then we can go to the gentleman in front of you. Young, thank you. <laughs> um, you may have touched on this. Can we get that mic up? On? It's on. Sounds better. It's on. It's on. There, there we go. go. There we go. Um, does anybody want to talk about legal impediments to vulnerability? Can you speak up? Can, does anyone want to wade into the issue of legal impediments or challenges to, to vulnerability research? Oh, or yeah. offer, I know this is something that's sort of been talked about, but quietly. Can I get another 40 minutes? Because that would be. <laughs> no, so that, that was, if, if I didn't do this panel, I was going to do that panel. But. Um, sure. Uh, Katie. <laughs> While I am not a lawyer, um, uh, I, I, do, I do advise a lot on, on regulating cybersecurity research and that kind of thing. Um, I think for as long as we've had, in the United States, as long as we've had the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and the Digital Millennium Copyrights Acts, uh, they have been used uh, as, a, as a silencing tool by vendors um, who really don't want to hear from the security research community. Um, I think that while those, that while those legal tools were in place uh, originally intending to, you know, at least make it a crime to, to go and, you know, do a war game style hacking of, uh, hacking of, of the Department of Defense, et cetera, um, I think at this point, uh, we've moved past, we've moved past as an industry needing to use legal tools to discourage um, essentially uncovering uh, security vulnerabilities. In a lot of ways, these tools are, are kind of used to silence the digital whistleblowers of, of our world who are here to let you know that, in fact, security, you know, security of these devices isn't something you can just trust, but you must actually verify. And these security researchers need to be allowed to do so. So um, I think the chilling effect on security research is more dangerous to not just the American public, but the world than, uh, you know, than, than these laws uh, have, have really allowed for. So um, working with others in many different coalitions and spaces to get some of these issues addressed is, is one of the reasons why I've been falling on this policy grenade for as long as I have, having been a former hacker myself. Um, so I think it is very, very important. And we're not going to be able to move forward uh, without addressing some of these these large gaps in legislation that don't really provide enough protection for individual security researchers. Any others? I just said policy grenade. I did. You did? Yeah. I heard it. I thought there was a. Okay, same comment. We got one from Twitter. Mike coming. 
Oh, yeah, there we go. Okay, so this question is from Twitter, and it says, to what extent are complex vulnerabilities, like you've discussed today, the norm, or are they black spawns? Important, but rare. To what extent what I, I think it's to what extent Com are they common or rare? To what extent are vulnerabilities? Complicated. Are these the complex ones that like vulnerabilities <clears throat> rare or common? Complex. No, none of these are rare. My God, we've run out of CVE numbers. This is not. None well, I of think these the question was more about like like really complex ones, like ah. like the GPAC, or, or is are, are they sort of more bog standard rare ones? No, I mean this is this common. is the new normal. It's I mean, common, exactly. right? we, have, yeah. we have so many things of internet, yeah. and there are only going to be more of these things. They're doing their thing. Yeah, that that no, this is this is the new normal. Yeah, yeah. right. It, it's it, getting back to supply supply chain as an example of this. If you don't know what you put in your box, yeah. and I don't know what's in the box that I'm using at home, you, you can't even have a, a chance to fix it. So even, even basic things like inventory, bill of materials, knowing what you're running, knowing OpenSSL is in there, knowing that Dbus is, is in there um, for the Jeep thing, if you don't know those things, you're never gonna be able to even patch them in the first place. Yeah. And even the producers of these things, don't, they don't know that. Yeah, most Which most is an awful uh, practice. Right? right. Most of the the new vendors Inventory. who are now Just suddenly uh, putting software on their devices and, and introducing internet connectivity, the the smart thing to do is to use somebody else's code. So use open source libraries, um, ideally written by people who know what they're doing. Especially, you know, I always say if you're if you're going to roll your own crypto, for God's sake, don't <laughs> smoke it. Um, but you know, so. Not rolling your own, you know, cryptographic solutions is a smart thing to do. However, our dependence on libraries like OpenSSL makes, you know, makes makes the entire world vulnerable when there's a critical vulnerability found. And it's that idea of trying to get, you know, trying to get that coordination working properly, um, and trying to make sure that once you patch the library, you still actually have to recompile code using that library. So it's a multi-step. Thing to protect people when something like a complex vulnerability uh, or a complex disclosure, like a Heartbleed type of disclosure, happens, where you have to coordinate not just creating the patch, but getting the patch to the folks who are going to recompile their code with the fixed library and then raising the awareness publicly for everyone else to go ahead and catch up and do it. Um, yes, this is the new normal. And as people incorporate these libraries, uh, not necessarily knowing what they've, what they've incorporated, using older and outdated versions, because that's what they were testing on when they developed their thing, um, all of this is going to be a bigger and bigger problem. And, well, and then it rolls into you get the patch, you apply the patch, you build your new software. Well, if your thing is a couple of years old, then you run the risk of, OK, you push this out. Let's say you're even really good and you have an OTA mechanism. What percentage of your population is going to get bricked? Right. Mm -hmm. And what kind of customer satisfaction issues are you going to have as a result of that? So um, yeah. Or if it's an embedded device, can you even Precisely. effectively yeah. patch it? Right. And right. Just from I an would... OS perspective, we've seen about six to eight of these big problems a year, and I expect it to only grow. Yeah, you, if you brick a pacemaker, you brick a human. And this is not an acceptable outcome. Um, well, on that really cheerful. <laughs> I'm really cheerful I think that's a perfect today. place to just put a, put a pin in it. Uh, <laughs> what do you guys think? Absolutely. Uh, but thank, uh, thank you guys very much. And uh, if you could join me in thanking uh, our panelists for taking the time to talk to us today.